Welcome to the Model Health Show. This is Finish Your Nutrition Expert, Sean Stevenson, and I'm so grateful for you tuning in with me today. There's so many different things that impact our health. And a question that I want to pose to you is, where does our health really come from? Where does our health reside? What's governing what's happening with all of the cells in our bodies? We have upwards of 100 trillion cells that kind of make up this powerful cellular community that makes you. And the governing force is your beautiful brain. All right, your brain is regulating everything at hyperspeed, and it's of the utmost importance to take care of this organ. We can't talk about burning fat and having great heart health if we're not talking about what's happening with our brain. There's so many things your brain is regulating in relationship to both of those things. For example, with fat loss, we've got your hypothalamus. That's kind of the master regulator that's integrating your endocrine system and your nervous system, kind of feeding off the environment, dictating what's happening with uh, your neurotransmitters, your hormones, and fat loss really boils down to your hormones. And we've got the HPA axis, so the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, and that super highway along that path is also your thyroid, right? There's so much going on here. And this, you know, your thyroid is known as kind of this master regulator of your metabolism, but the ship is driven by your brain. And our brain health, again, is of the utmost importance. And so today I want to bring on probably the best person in the world in this subject matter when we're talking about nutrition related to our brain health. And he's going to share some mind-blowing critical information with you, and I'm very, very excited to have him on. Before we do that, I want to give a quick shout-out. Since we're talking about brain health, University of Malaya found that lion's mane mushroom is clinically proven to be neuroprotective. So it's protecting your neurons in your brain. Specifically, they also had another kind of piggyback study looking at people who have traumatic brain injury and how that was actually able to help to regenerate brain tissue. What? what? Is this even possible? Yes, it's possible. All right. Of course, there's some wonderful things in nature, wonderful foods that have some great benefits for the brain, but something specifically like this that's neuroprotective, that's pretty rare. So lion's mane mushroom, but here's the key. I want you to make sure that it's dual extracted. This means it's a hot water extract and alcohol extract to actually get all of the, the goodies that we're trying to get from it. The one company I know to do that is Four Sigmatic. Okay, so head over to foursigmatic.com forward slash model. That's F-O-U-R-S-I-G-M-A-T-I-C.com forward slash model. You get 15% off all of their incredible medicinal mushroom elixirs and mushroom coffees as well. Yes, mushroom coffee re revolution is in full effect. All right, and also they got mushroom hot chocolates and all these cool things. I love their chaga. I love their reishi with clinically proven benefits for improving your sleep quality. Head over there, check them out. I promise that you're gonna love it. And on that note, let's get to the iTunes review of the week. Another five-star review titled Best Health Podcast Ever by Nicole Printon. Fitness has been my passion for over 20 years. Sean's podcast has caused a major shift in what I thought I knew about nutrition. Thank you, Sean, for bringing us cutting edge fitness and nutrition info that causes us to dig deeper and learn more so that we can grow into our healthiest, best selves. I've been listening to you for years, but after hearing your interview with Sean T, I just had to leave a review. Thanks for changing minds, bodies, and spirits with your work. Nicole Printon. Awesome, Nicole. Thank you so much for that. And that means the world to me. Uh, I appreciate you immensely. Thanks for taking the time and just sharing the love. And I'm just grateful for being a part of your life and, and your world. So everybody, thank you for leaving these reviews over on iTunes. Please keep them coming. If you've yet to leave a review, please pop over and do so. And on that note, let's get to our special guest and topic of the day. Our guest today is the one and only Dr. David Perlmutter. And Dr. Perlmutter is a board certified neurologist and four time, four time, New York Times bestselling author. He serves on the board of directors and is a fellow of the American College of Nutrition. And I believe he might be the only person that has that distinction right now, which is amazing. Dr. Perlmutter received his MD degree from the University of Miami School of Medicine, where he was awarded the Leonard G. Roundtree Research Award. And he's published extensively in peer-reviewed scientific journals, including Archives of Neurology, Neurosurgery and the Journal of Applied Nutrition. And these are all sources that I go to when I'm doing research. And he's one of the guys putting the information out there. So powerful. His books have been published in 28 languages and include Grain Brain, The Surprising Truth About Wheat, Carbs, and Sugar, which has over a million copies in print, Brain Maker, The Grain Brain Cookbook, and his most recent book, 
the Grain Brain Whole Life Plan. And he's been interviewed on many nationally syndicated TV shows, including 2020, Larry King Live, CNN, Fox News, Oprah, The Dr. Oz Show, and on and on. And he's also the recipient of numerous awards, including the Linus Pauling Award for his innovative approaches to neurological disorders, the National Nutrition Foods Association Clinician of the Year Award, the Humanitarian of the Year Award from the American College of Nutrition, and the Media Award from the American College of Nutrition. He's just an absolutely uh, well-respected and just brilliant thinker and brilliant teacher. And I'd like to welcome to the Model Health Show, Dr. David Perlmutter. How are you doing today, David? Well, I am doing great, Sean. Delighted to be with you today. I'm so happy to have you on. I've been looking forward to this conversation for a long time. Me too. I would love to start with your story, you know, your superhero origin story. Let's talk a little bit about that. What got you interested in health and medicine in the first place? Well, I grew up in a very medical environment. My father was a very uh, accomplished brain surgeon. And, uh, you know, I, I was probably one of the few areas I could choose to try to relate to him was yeah. because he was so dedicated to his craft. So I, I figured early on that, um, you know, the, the best way to approach my dad would be to try to learn as much as I could about what he did. So I actually found myself, even as a young kid, age 13, uh, in the operating room with him, mm. uh, holding open, you know, the brain while he would take out brain tumors and you name it. In those days, you know, you could get away with that kind of stuff. And uh, I thought it was fascinating. The brain was very, very fascinating. And I decided to study uh, more about the brain in college, published my first paper when I was uh, 19 and uh, began lecturing, lectured at the American Heart Association uh, when I was 19 and really just jumped in with both feet. And, um, you know, after all of my training and I began practicing neurology, uh, I was ultimately really dismayed because we didn't help anybody hmm. to any significant degree. You know, neurology is kind of a uh, an area of medicine where it's pretty much diagnose and adios, meaning we can tell you what you've got, but the uh, grab bag of therapies that are available to brain specialists uh, is very, very limited. Hmm. So I began to wonder, well, why are people having these issues in the first place? In other words, uh, if you could figure that part out, then you might be able to start thinking about preventing these issues. Who knew? And, you know, it turns out as I began researching that there was already publications appearing uh, around the world indicating that diet, for example, and lifestyle had a huge role to play in determining the brain's destiny. Well, here we are now 35 years into this and um, still uh, fighting the fight, you know, still trying to, to let the world know that our brain's destiny is something we control. Mm. When you talk about something, for example, like Alzheimer's, which in 2018 is going to cost the globe a trillion dollars, uh, far more than the market value of Google or Apple, uh, that this is a disease for which there is no treatment at all, no treatment whatsoever. And you know, my mission at this time is to let everybody know that your lifestyle choices play a major role in determining your brain's destiny. And uh, we're going to keep hammering away at that in, in every venue that we get. You know, I, Sean, I appreciate being with you today because, again, it's yet another platform. And I'm sure that your demographic is one that recognizes that, you know, this is uh, these are decisions I make about my future health. That's what you're all about. So. Uh, it's great that we're having this time together. Absolutely. And it's so exciting. And, you know, to see the the tides changing with the work that you're putting out is just really remarkable. And your book, Grain Brain, I think that this is one of those books that should be mandatory reading if you're interested in just being alive. All right. It's so important. It's so loaded. The way that you write and how you really speak to my to my man brain and also woman brain, but the more analytical kind of part of me and looking at, oh, this is what's going on behind the scenes. It's really fascinating. And one of the conditions most people fear is memory loss. And that falls right. under kind of this umbrella of diseases of Alzheimer's and dementia. And I really want to get to the subject out to a much bigger kind of public conversation. And um, most of the world doesn't know this, but there's a huge connection between dysregulated blood glucose, insulin resistance, and Alzheimer's. So can you please help folks understand why this is? 
You know, it, it, it's a, a terrific question, and it's one that I actually answered just yesterday. I had the distinct opportunity to go to Washington, D.C., and address the World Bank, uh, not just for the 1,000 people that were in uh, the States, but at 150 sites that were tuned in around the world because of this global epidemic. And you can be sure that this sugar uh, issue was front and center in terms of its detrimental effects upon the brain. So we began suspecting uh, that blood sugar was an issue, you know, about a decade ago. And since then, we've seen some really nice research, one uh, from a Dr. Rosebud Roberts at Mayo Clinic, uh, publishing, uh, demonstrating that when you look at people's diets, those individuals with the, whose most, uh, most favor carbohydrates as a calorie source have about an 88% increased risk for Alzheimer's disease, a disease for which there is no treatment. Those whose diets favored higher levels of fat, the dreaded fat as a calorie source, actually had about a 44% reduction in risk for, again, Alzheimer's disease. And that really, uh, from a dietary perspective, frames in where our discussion can go. And that is that uh, a diet that's rich in carbohydrates and especially simple carbohydrates is one that ultimately leads to insulin resistance and elevated blood sugar. The brain absolutely does not tolerate elevations of blood sugar, even subtle elevations of blood sugar. An outstanding report appeared in 2013 in September uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine, arguably one of the most well-respected medical journals on the planet. It was a very interesting study that took several thousand individuals. And at the beginning of the study, they did a brain, uh, a cognitive study to determine how well their brains were working. And they did one other test. They measured their blood sugar. About six and a half years later, they came back and they said, okay, we're gonna examine your brain function. Uh, and then they said, who had dementia by now and uh, who did not? And what they found was a powerful direct correlation between even subtle elevations of blood sugar and risk for dementia. And what was really interesting is in the conclusion they stated that even mild elevations of blood pressure, well within the range of what your doctor is gonna say is a normal blood sugar. Did I say blood pressure? You did. Blood sugar. Even if your doctor says this is still in the normal range, is already associated with elevation of risk for dementia. So you can have a blood sugar of 105, and your doctor gives you a pat on the back and uh, says, don't worry about it. You're not diabetic. Everything's cool. You know what, it's not. According to our most well-respected research, it's not cool at all. You already have an increased risk for disease that has no treatment. Our mission is to get that information out to everybody to empower them to make choices. The idea of having a blood sugar being okay at 100 to 105 is not good enough. While that might be considered normal, you know, Sean, for you and me and your audience and for everyone, we want people to be optimal not mm. in the normal range. The normal range is, is a completely contrived idea based upon statistics in terms of what we call standard deviations. I want everybody to know what's best for their brain and the lower the blood sugar, the better the insulin sensitivity, uh, the better it is for your brain. Now there are, there are many mechanisms that relate this elevation of blood sugar to damage in the brain. And mm -hmm. I think probably the, one of the biggest players is when your blood sugar is elevated, that blood sugar binds to proteins. We call that glycation. As a matter of fact, uh, many people don't know it, but they're probably very familiar with this because of the blood test called A1C. If you watch the evening news, you see all these advertisements for people who are generally overweight and should be on a, a, a higher fat, lower carb diet. But anyway, they're taking drugs to lower their A1C. What is A1C? It's sugar bound to a protein, in this case, hemoglobin. So it's called the hemoglobin A1C. The level of A1C directly correlates to the degree of brain shrinkage on an annual basis. And that degree of shrinkage outperforms the amount of brain shrinkage you get, even if you carry the so-called Alzheimer's gene. Why that's important is because, you know, you can't take the diving board off your gene pool. You can't rewrite your genes you got from your parents and all who came before you. But what we now understand is that you can change your gene expression. You can change the very expression of your life code. 
We know that about 70% of our DNA that codes for health and longevity is under our direct control by uh, changing our lifestyle, by eating appropriately, by gaining exercise, making sure our sleep is restorative, by mm. limiting stress. We can pave the way for a healthy brain. And that's very, very empowering, yeah. uh, especially when we know that we have no treatment for our most dreaded brain condition, that being Alzheimer's. Yeah, wow. It's, it's incredibly empowering. At the same time, it's very sobering just for us to kind of like look at some of this and some of the confusion, especially when it's related to our blood sugar and how much that impacts our brain. Uh, in the book, you say that, and so, of course, our blood sugar, one of the big players is insulin, which is an incredibly important hormone. We tend to think about diabetes in relationship to this, but you say insulin doesn't just escort glucose into our cells. It's also an anabolic hormone, meaning it stimulates growth, promotes fat formation and retention, and encourages inflammation. And all of those things are detrimental to our brain. That's right. And you know, everybody recognizes insulin for what we all learned about, uh, and that is it, it's what is secreted by your pancreas to lower your blood sugar after a meal. Okay, great. But I think that uh, Gary Taubes has done an excellent job in uh, writing the book, Why We Get Fat and What to Do About It, you know, really explaining that insulin has other very important roles in human physiology. And most uh, importantly, as you well mentioned, it stimulates what we call lipogenesis, the creation of fat, and it inhibits lipolysis, the breakdown of fat. And that is a great thing because it allowed us to survive. Mm -hmm. uh, when we, as hunter-gatherers, would find in the late summer uh, blueberries, we would eat the blueberries, the sugar would, would be in our bodies, raise our blood sugar, stimulate insulin, we would lay down fat and we could survive throughout the winter of caloric scarcity. Problem with that mechanism is it's still in play and people are catering to that mechanism 365 days a year for the winter that never shows up. So, you know, uh, hunting and gathering isn't hunting down the convenience store and gathering up the corn chips. Hmm. It, it really is being active and on a diet that's higher in fat and protein and remarkably lower in uh, sugar and carbohydrates. So, you know, getting back to uh, this notion of changing gene expression, what has been, I think, the most um, a pending uh, event in my professional career in terms of discoveries has have been two, as a matter of fact. First, the notion that we can change our gene expression. And second is something you alluded to just a, a bit ago, and that is that we have the ability to continue growing brain cells, to regenerate and repopulate our brains throughout our lifetimes. And certainly that is something that was not taught to me in medical school in the 1980s. We were told you got a certain number of brain cells and that was it. And it was pretty much, uh, pretty much we were on the skids after age about 18. It was a one way and that was downhill. But we know uh, now through the work of Dr. Peter Erickson published only in 1998 uh, that humans retain the ability to repopulate our brains with new brain cells throughout our lifetimes. Even into our senescence, we uh, we have the ability to grow new brain cells. And this growing of new brain cells is uh, one way to stave off dementia, and it's under our control. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, your audience is probably on the edge of their seats right now, like I am, wondering, well, what in the heck can I do to make that happen? How do I enhance the growth of new brain cells? And I tell people, there's something you have to buy. And here's the pitch. You've got to go out and buy a new pair of sneakers. That's it. And you can get any brand you like. So this is uh, non-denominational. Why is that so important? Because uh, as we've learned uh, from work at University of Pittsburgh, a collaborative study with UCLA, that probably aerobic exercise is the most powerful way that we can change our gene expression and flip on the switch that turns on the gene that makes a chemical called BDNF that grows new brain cells. Levels of BDNF correlate to reduced risk of dementia. Levels of BDNF correlate to better memory. And as we just learned a couple of months ago, low levels of BDNF in women are strongly associated with risk for suicide. So this is a very, very important um, growth hormone uh, that we can increase in our bodies by spending some time walking, dancing, 
uh, on the elliptic machine, swimming, biking, whatever it is that you can do to get your heart rate up and do it every single day. This may be associated, according to the conclusions reached by Dr. Erickson and his team, uh, may be associated with a 50% reduce, a reduction in risk for Alzheimer's disease. Mm. Wow. So I gave this, this talk just yesterday. Yeah. And I paused at that point. And I didn't want to ask how many in the audience have ever heard of that, because I know very few hands would go up. But I said, you guys have spent these two hours with me today. I am going to close the door until each and every one of you promises that you're going to take this to heart and make changes. You know, a lot of times when you give lectures, I know you know this. Yeah. Somebody, I mean, a lot of people say, oh, I heard Sean today. It was really interesting. But that's as far as it gets. I want action. I really do. You know, that's the mission. It's your mission, too, is we're giving out this incredible information that's halfway. The other half is, OK, then your audience gets it. They've got to act on it. And, you know, this is knowledge that is hugely, hugely empowering. Yeah, as simple as that. The only thing you need to buy is some new shoes. So whether it's the Nikes you guys are rocking or Skechers or if it was like me when I was a kid, I wanted my mom to buy me some Pumas and she literally bought me Panthers. All right, true story. All right, Panthers do exist. It's an off-brand shoe. And I uh, uh, strangely accidentally stepped in a bucket of paint. And I was like, I can't wear these no more, Mom. Uh, so that's so, so powerful. Just I would have worn them after the paint. They probably look great. Right. <laughs> especially today, especially today. But it's so powerful to know that how much exercise can influence whether or not we have this. Again, like this is something that a hunt, if you look at the research, you see about 100 million people over the next 30 years being impacted by Alzheimer's. This does not have to happen. And that's an incredible insight. And by the way, when you talked about kind of, and you talk about this in the book as well, our thrifty genes and how we're kind of hardwired for this feast, feast and famine situation. But today we don't even hunt, you know, and you talked about hunting, maybe going to the convenience store and hunting down some corn chips. I pictured like a guy wearing a long, long cloth with a spear walking into 7-Eleven. That would be hilarious. But that's the extent of what we have to do to get our food. You know, it's most of the time just walking into your kitchen. And so, wow, this is profound. And also, really quickly, I want to point to, and I just mentioned this in the conversation that I just had on the Dr. Oz show about Alzheimer's related to sleep deprivation. And one of the things, because these are TV segments, we didn't really get into is how much insulin resistance from sleep deprivation influences our risk of Alzheimer's. Because even just one night of sleep debt can create, make you look like you have blood sugars as though you type 2 diabetic or at least insulin resistant. And your brain can have this kind of situation where it's insulin resistant as well. We see about 14% uh, reduction in brain activity and also kind of circulation utilization of glucose by the brain when you're sleep deprived. So tying all this That's together. That's right. In, in my, my newer book, which is based on Grain Brain called The Grain Brain Whole Life Plan, I talk about the importance of sleep and talk about how I, as, a, uh, as an adult, but also as a guy whose father died of Alzheimer's disease, um, felt that, you know, I, I didn't know how well I was sleeping, so I went and had a sleep study as well, and everything came out okay. But I think people should do that. I mean, uh, you know, you cannot underestimate the power of a good night's rest. That's when the brain consolidates memory, and at the same time activates what's called the glymphatic system to clear debris. Uh, interestingly, one bad night of sleep, uh, or sleep deprivation, one bad night, while it does affect insulin and blood sugar actually, crazily, uh, does actually elevate this brain-derived neurotrophic factor. So it, uh, there is some benefit, perhaps, to, to uh, a sleep deprivation of one night. But you know, the people that we're talking about are people who are snoring, who have sleep apnea, periodic leg movements, whatever, that are waking them up, drawing them out of restorative sleep, and they are at dramatically increased risk for Alzheimer's. Uh, and certainly uh, insulin resistance and diabetes. And let me just uh, make this very important correlation. In a country that has 23 million confirmed diabetics already, where one third of adults are pre-diabetic and on their way to really a fairly uh, a significant illness, my interest is uh, you know, in the brain. And that relates to diabetes because if you become a type two diabetic, and think of those statistics I just revealed, you have doubled your risk for Alzheimer's again 
and I'll repeat it, a disease for which no is, there is no treatment. The reason I keep repeating that is, again, we live in this society where we're pretty much told, do whatever the heck you want to do. And when you suddenly come down with a problem, there's a pill for you. And, you know, as you and I have this conversation, there is no treatment. There's no magic pill that can help you with your uh, Alzheimer's that will reverse this condition. It doesn't exist. Am I in favor of drug research? You bet I am. I think it's great. But I think, uh, you know, um, there's a quote from Albert Einstein that says, intelligent people fix problems, geniuses prevent them. Yes. And, you know, uh, John Kennedy said that uh, the time to fix the roof is when the sun is shining. And I think that's where we are. But what we're doing here uh, as a physician, what I'm doing is I'm hitting the ball back across the net to the other side. And that means the responsibility is going back to you, uh, everyone who's watching uh, this uh, interview, that your doctor has nothing for you in terms of treating your brain if you have uh, Alzheimer's. And you could be well on your way. You know, the changes that begin in the brain uh, before you can't find your keys or forget the Wi-Fi code or go into the room and don't know why, yeah. those changes begin 20 to 30 years ahead of time. So we've got to get you exercising this afternoon, tomorrow. Uh, we've got to make it happen. We've got to get your blood sugars down. We've got to lower your insulin levels. You've got to get your hemoglobin A1C down into the low fives. Uh, all of these things need to be maximized. Vitamin D level in the optimal range, all important. And you know, it's not like there is an Alzheimer's diet, like there's a heart smart diet or an osteoporosis diet. They're all the same. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine that you have to pick the diet to pick the, and pick the disease that you don't want to get right. and take your chances on all the rest? No, the same diet uh, is involved in uh, reducing inflammation that is good for your heart, good for your cancer risk, good for your risk for diabetes, because those are also inflammatory conditions, Alzheimer's, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, they're all inflammation-based diseases. So when we lower our sugars and we increase our healing fat and we exercise and sleep appropriately, we're dropping down these inflammation numbers in our bodies and that's good from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. So it's, uh, it's all size really does, uh, all fits all. One size does fits all. Mm. Okay, so just to jump and change gears here, uh, I would love to talk about how in the world does our friendly neighborhood loaf of whole wheat bread play into this whole equation? Uh, let's start with the surprising impact that wheat has on our blood sugar first and then kind of dive deeper from there. Well, it, it's, a good, it, it's a good question because, you know, wheat in and of itself uh, I don't think, and th this may surprise you coming from these lips, is so tragic in terms of blood sugar. Uh, that whole wheat, whole grain wheat is, is a, a threat, but because of the fiber that that would contain, it's not the biggest culprit. You know, the biggest culprit is going to be the refined grain where the fiber is removed and uh, you wonder, wonder uh, how mm. people can eat that type of bread, for example, or other products. The other issue, of course, with wheat is the fact that it's a gluten-containing grain, like a barley and rye, and to the, a great extent in America, at least, oats because of how they are milled. Gluten is made up of another protein called gliadin, and alpha-gliadin has been shown to increase the permeability or the leakiness of the intestines in all humans, according to Dr. Alessio Fasano at Harvard. It's this permeability or leakiness of the gut that causes inflammation, and as I just mentioned, the cornerstone of our most dreaded conditions, including Alzheimer's. So yeah, I'm connecting a few dots along the way, if I have the liberty to do that. And it's for this reason that I recommend avoiding wheat products. Why, again, because they contain gluten, and also they are high uh, reasons for uh, uh, elevating blood sugar. Whole wheat bread has a very, very high glycemic index uh, which is uh, means that it's going to raise blood sugar quite significantly. And, you know, frankly, a slice of whole wheat bread has a higher glycemic index than a Snickers bar. And that's you know, that raises eyebrows because here's a candy bar, but the reality is the, the calories in the candy bar are coming, sure, from some sugar, 
but there's a lot of fat in the chocolate and in the nuts. And those are good fats. And I'm not saying we should be focusing our diet on a Snickers bar, but I am saying that if we're looking and looking at and judging our foods based upon the glycemic index, and this whole wheat slice of bread does not belong on the plate based upon those two very important parameters. Um, it alludes, however, also to the notion of the importance of, of fiber in the diet. And I cannot overemphasize that enough. Most importantly, because of the role of fiber and specifically what we call prebiotic fiber to nurture the gut bacteria. When we do so, it paves the way for better health and reduces inflammation and stabilizes blood sugar. What more do we want? Mm, yes, yes. And, uh, you know, the, the word gluten itself is Latin for glue, just FYI, everybody. And something interesting you talked about in the book uh, that I've been talking about for quite some time, but uh, just really highlighting this and the opiate receptors in the brain and how that is influenced when we eat wheat. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Well, in wheat, uh, there are chemicals that actually do bind to receptors in the brain that are the type of receptors that are sensitive, for example, to mor morphine. And I think uh, my friend, Dr. William Davis, in the book Wheat Belly, really does a marvelous job in describing uh, these, uh, how these chemicals work, how they uh, make people feel after they eat wheat. And you know, when you stimulate those receptors, it's probably a good feeling. Uh, that's why people become addicted to opiates, for example. So you know, it's working on the human uh, at multiple levels in order to spread its seeds. We have been cultivated by the wheat plant. Humans have been cultivated by the wheat plant to spread itself around the globe. And it did a marvelous job. It's been very successful. We usually say, oh, we cultivated the wheat. But you can look at it the other way. It, by harvesting um, this activity in the human brain, wheat has been very successful to become as pervasive as it has mm -hmm. globally, representing as much, for example, in the United States as 40% uh, of the foods that we uh, consume. So we see that. Now, does it mean that all grains are bad? No, it doesn't mean that at all. Uh, I've been, uh, people have said, well, Dr. Promoter doesn't want you to eat any grains at all. Not true. Uh, if you have some wild rice uh, that is organically grown, I think a serving is not bad. I think quinoa, which isn't by definition a grain, but everybody talks about it as such, uh, is in moderation a good food, high in protein, great source of fiber. So I think that you know these are some straightforward recommendations uh, in terms of what people can be doing to better their chances of preserving their brains. I mean, uh, you know, when your risk for Alzheimer's is 50-50 for all Americans, if you live, live to be age 85, that is the flip of a coin. We can do a lot better than that and that is just by looking at our blood sugars, getting some exercise, eating the right kind of fat. And there are a few important supplements along the way that I think are really good as well. Definitely. We'll, we'll touch on that in a little bit. I want to uh, talk a, lo a little bit about the common mistakes patients and pr practitioners make when thinking that just because they test negative for celiac, they assume that their health problems are not related to gluten consumption. So that is a wonderful question yeah. because I am confronted by that probably every day, uh, either directly or through what I read. You know, on my Google alert, obviously I have uh, gluten, uh, gluten sensitivity, celiac. You know, those are so when something's published, I get those reports. And time and time again, even to this day, there was a study published yesterday, or rather a paper uh, in uh, one Minneapolis newspaper just yesterday that said. What's with all this gluten-free craze just because, you know, a tennis player and an actress, Gwyneth Paltrow, and all these people say that they feel better going gluten-free. That's not enough uh, to, to tell people they're going, they should go gluten-free because there are health consequences. And we'll get to that in just a minute of being gluten-free, which is absurd. Well, what the argument is, is, well, if you don't have celiac disease, bring it on. Eat all the gluten you want because it's totally fine. It's great for you. And that is really unfortunate that people are getting that message because it's ridiculous and it's not what current science is telling us. Yes, the 1.8% of Americans who have celiac disease have got to avoid uh, gluten in any 
uh, way that it may be delivered have to be very strict because they have an autoimmune condition uh, that is sensitive to this protein. Beyond that, as was recently published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, again, a study out of Harvard, demonstrates that there are significant numbers of individuals who have non-celiac gluten sensitivity, meaning they don't have the blood markers uh, for the autoimmune condition that we call celiac disease, and yet they have significant reactions to consuming gluten that are not just gastrointestinal, that may be neurological, they may have a movement disorder, they may have cognitive impairment, uh, they may have uh, even uh, mood changes as it relates to consumption of gluten. This has been validated in peer-reviewed science. So when you see these people saying, oh, go and eat all the gluten you want, mm. uh, uh, you're fine if you don't have celiac disease, it's such a disservice to the, you know, the millions of people who may be sensitive and who felt better by going gluten-free then read this article and then they question whether it's related. Uh, ultimately, the good news is they re-challenge themselves with gluten, they feel poorly again, and then uh, once again, they finally realize they made the right decision to stay off of gluten. There was an interesting report that was spun in the news that said that if you go gluten-free, you increase your risk for heart disease. Wow, I, you know, that's breathtaking. And I, I can't imagine how eliminating something that's potentially toxic uh, would increase your risk of heart disease. And what they found, uh, what the study actually showed was that people who are gluten-free generally avoid lots of grains, whether they contain gluten or not, and therefore have less fiber in their diet, and that may be associated with increased risk for cardiovascular disease. I buy into that one lock, stock, and barrel. Uh, the point is how it was spun, however, was that going gluten-free has this health risk cardiovascular disease. And so yeah. all the, the, you know, the dietitians uh, said, aha, now we've got you. And that's not what the study proved at all, nor was that what the authors concluded at the end of the research. They made it very clear that people who go gluten-free generally avoid all types of grains and therefore they're getting less fiber in their diets. So, uh, you know, the admonition from me is if you go gluten-free and you should, make sure you have other sources of good fiber in your diet. Fiber is so lacking in the standard American diet, an acronym for SAD, uh, very, very important because of its role in nurturing the gut bacteria, which make B vitamins, which make our neurotransmitters to keep us uh, focused and happy, uh, which play a role in regulating inflammation, so, uh, and controlling blood sugar and appetite and mood. So we've really got to spend a lot of thought uh, devoted to how we nurture our gut bacteria, and fiber is the key player here. Awesome. And I'll put this in the show notes as well. We did a show dedicated to the dangers of a gluten-free diet. And um, one of the things is, you know, we hear this catchword like, okay, gluten-free is healthy, so we just go ham on the gluten-free donuts, uh, gluten-free bread, gluten-free, you know, Gluten-free for life, you get a tattoo on yourself, gluten-free. And the reality is we're just swapping out one unhealthy choice for another unhealthy choice. And, of course, there's options. Like when you do want to have a gluten-free treat, there are options for that. But straight up just basing your lifestyle on eating foods because they're gluten-free is, is dangerous. And so, again, I'll put that in the show notes. And I love if you I, could... I love that. You know, you go to the grocery store and walk down the gluten-free yeah. aisle and you see the most horrendous choices. Uh, of yeah. foods that are so laden, laden with uh, sugar, uh, and and but they're gluten free. You think then uh, you know you can eat them, and I also get a kick out of all the foods that are now labeled gluten free but never had gluten in the first place. Right. Uh, yeah. So it, it's so great. You know, it's a sales thing. And uh, yeah. But I, I think nonetheless, uh, it's important. I think gluten free is very very important and. Uh, you know, we have seen so many patients over the years who've had problems for decades and finally were able to improve their skin, their joint pain, their headaches, uh, their mood just by dropping the gluten. Yeah, I would love uh, to go through some of your patient stories. But I, again, everybody, this is a mandatory book to get Grain Brain. The stories are phenomenal. And, um, you know, just a sidebar throw in here, the, the gluten-free products. This is a true story the other day. I was at the store and I see this gluten-free stuff in the freezer and there was a product called gluten-free muffin tops, 
right? Gluten-free muffin tops. And it's just like so ironic who made this poor choice in names because the muffin top is something people are trying to get rid of, you know, physically, if you got a muffin top. Right. But, and you've heard the statement, you are what you eat. And so I posted on Instagram, I was like, the award for the most poorly named food product goes to. But because, it's, again, it's gluten-free, it's uh, all, all good or, or not. So next up, I would love to talk a little bit about uh, these. Another issue potentially here is the impact on inflammation. In, in inflammatory cytokines and antibodies that can get produced from adding wheat into our diet? Well, again, our mission for health is reducing inflammation. That's, you know, that's job one. Let me just say parenthetically that inflammation uh, at a low level is, you know, it's a very important process. It's what uh, our bodies do to deal with infection, for example, to help us with trauma, uh, to wall off an area, help it heal. But it's this unbridled, unrelenting uh, inflammation that is characteristic of these degenerative conditions that really gets us into trouble. You know, these chronic degenerative conditions, the heart disease, Alzheimer's, cancer, diabetes, are ranked by the World Health Organization as the number one cause of death on planet Earth now. Not infectious issues, not war, it's these chronic degenerative conditions which are spreading around the world as more and more of the world adopts the Western type diet of higher sugar, higher carbs, and getting rid of the good fat. So we've got to do everything we can to reduce inflammation. Wheat, because it contains gluten, uh, is a very pro-inflammatory scenario. It's why you gotta avoid wheat. Am I against eating wheat? Yes, I am. I'm trying to do the very best I can to give people the story as I see it. And, you know, let me just say to your viewers that uh, Dr. Perlmutter's story has changed over the years, no question. I mean, 20 years ago, our dis discussion about fat and uh, carbohydrates was different. And I think it's a good thing. I mean, I, I see, you know, the fact that what you hear from me is based upon the current literature, based upon our most up-to-date research, changes with time and that's a good thing because it's you know it's it's a moving target we're trying to stay ahead of the game and not keep our feet stuck in the mud from 20 years ago so uh, you know I think that's really very very important I'd also say that um, all of the research that we do and all the publications that we provide and also review are on drperlmutter.com in their full form not just in the abstract their full PDFs are on our website and I also send out a, 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 a newsletter every single week for all of our subscribers at drperlmutter.com. So uh, if I may, you know, shout out to your viewers, if they want that free newsletter, just sign up and uh, our team sends it out. And it's stuff that I write every week that is very, very current. Um, you know, knowledge is power. And my life mission is just to give this stuff out as much as people will listen. Uh, are we up against... Uh, you know, a uh, big uh, industry that has other ideas in mind, you bet. Uh, but I think, you know, it's better to light the single candle than to curse the darkness. Although you got to mm -hmm. curse the darkness a little bit just to keep the darkness uh, in check. But the mission here is, is all about giving, in this case, your viewers, yeah. the best information as we see it today to make life-changing choices. Love it. Love it. Wow. The next thing I want to cover, and I think this is going to be absolutely game changing for folks who don't know about this, are some of the critical brain nutrients, specifically cholesterol. So we're going to talk about that right after this quick break. So sit tight. We'll be right back. Today, we're in the midst of a new revolution with our understanding of food. We used to just be focused on this macronutrient paradigm, proteins, fats, carbohydrates. Carbohydrates and proteins got a pretty good name, but fats were drug through the mud. Why is that? Because it's called fat, all right? The name implies something different than the other two. Because when we hear the word fat, we think about fat on our bodies. Fat in food and fat in our bodies are two totally different things. And it's like thinking, if I eat blueberries, I'm going to turn blue, when you think that eating fat is going to turn you fat. 
It just doesn't work like that. And any of those three macronutrients can actually put fat on your body if you eat too much or the wrong types. Healthy fats, which I'm proposing that we start to call lipids or even energy, are incredibly important for every single function in your body. Your cells, every single cell in your body, we have upwards of 100 trillion cells that make you up, require fats to just maintain the integrity of your cell membranes. We're talking about the thing that holds your cells together and enables your cells to communicate. It's very important. Also your brain, your brain is mostly fat and water. This is why fats are so important. When you're deficient in fats, especially the right kinds of fats, you can see some big issues. So in order to address that, some of my favorite things today are MCT oils. And specifically, if we look at emulsified MCT oils that actually taste amazing. And these are median chain triglyceride oils that are extracted from things like coconut or palm. And these medium chain triglycerides have a thermogenic effect on the body, which means they are able to positively alter your metabolism. All right, that's number one, thermogenic effect from MCT oils, positively altering your metabolism. Number two, MCTs are more easily absorbed by your cells. So unlike conventional food of any type that has to go through a pretty arduous process of digestion, turning that food stuff into you stuff, MCTs are able to go directly to your cells and provide almost instant energy. Number three, MCT oils are very protective of your microbiome. There's so much research today about the importance of having a healthy microbiome and the integrity of our gut. MCT oils are one of those things that help to support that because they're especially effective at combating viruses, parasites, bacteria, and there's so much goodness that is able to be found in these MCT oils, but you wanna get the good stuff. And for me, that's why I go to onit.com forward slash model. That's O-N-N-I-T.com forward slash M-O-D-E-L to get the emulsified MCT oils, which is like a coffee creamer. These are great to add to your coffees and teas, smoothies and things like that to get in a little bit of extra flavor plus all the benefits of MCT oils. They're easy to stir so you don't have to throw everything into a blender just to get a nice coffee drink, but also they taste good and they make the process of being healthy, fun and enjoyable. So head over, check them out. They've got vanilla, coconut, cinnamon swirl, and strawberry. It's one of my favorites. So go to onit.com forward slash model for 10% off your entire purchase, not just for the MCT oil, but all of the health and human performance supplements that Onit carries and all of their fitness equipment, gear, and so much other cool stuff. All right, head over there, check them out, onit.com forward slash model. Now back to the show. All right, we are back and we're talking with New York Times bestselling author, Dr. David Perlmutter. And just before the break, we were getting into some of the important brain nutrients. Like we know some of the things that we need to avoid that have this big potential downside with consuming them that have been kind of smuggled into the human diet recently in our evolution, namely wheat. And one of the most eye-opening sections in your book is when you talked about how critical cholesterol is to the health of the human brain. So first of all, what role does cholesterol actually play? You know, think of this, first of all, that you and I are having a health discussion about the virtues of cholesterol. You know, it's pretty remarkable. After all the castigation of this poor fat over the years, that cholesterol was responsible for everything bad in the world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, think about it, that 80% of the cholesterol on your blood test uh, that is measured in your blood is cholesterol that's made in your body because your body needs cholesterol. It's manufactured in your liver. So cholesterol has always been our friend. Uh, it's allowed us to be healthy. It's a very important fat. It is the precursor for vitamin D. It is the precursor for the sex hormones, progesterone, estrogen, testosterone. It's the precursor for cortisol. It is a fundamental component of the cell membranes for every cell in a person's body, including their brain cells, and it even acts as an antioxidant in the brain. So this bizarre war on cholesterol, as if cholesterol is responsible for heart disease, for example, has, I think, really been put to rest as of late. We do understand that uh, carrier proteins for cholesterol, like LDL, which somehow got the name 
bad cholesterol. It's neither bad nor it is a cholesterol. It's a protein for that matter. We do know that when that protein becomes damaged or glycated, bound to sugar, like we talked about earlier, and oxidized, it is related to narrowing of arteries. What happens is then cholesterol comes to the site of damage to repair the damage yeah. once the inflammation has happened. So, you know, the, the cholesterol is like the fireman coming to the fire, and yet we're blaming him for the fire in the first place. Mm -hmm. He's there to help. When you look at the data that shows that elderly people with the lowest cholesterol have the highest risk for dementia, that speaks volumes. It speaks volumes in the context of the number of older people who are taking cholesterol-lowering drugs for no good reason. We need cholesterol. Uh, our bodies thrive in a cholesterol-rich environment. Those very drugs, the statin medications that lower cholesterol, also inhibit the body's ability to make something very, very important, and it's called coenzyme Q10. And it's this deficiency of CoQ10 brought on by the statin medications that may be related to the cognitive issues people get on statin drugs, now called statin brain, and the muscle problems that are so pervasive in individuals taking the statin medications. So, you know, all that glitters isn't gold. Isn't gold. And we've, we've come to realize that these assumptions, that dietary fat was a terrible thing, that saturated fat was bad for us, uh, and that cholesterol was the enemy, we've got to lower it into a ditch as low as possible. Mm -hmm. These are antiquated ideas that still are a bit tenacious. You know, people still are holding on to them. Many, many doctors are still telling people, we've got to lower your cholesterol and you've got to stop eating cholesterol. The truth of the matter is dietary cholesterol relates very little to your blood cholesterol. So eat the eggs and yes, eat the yolks where the cholesterol lives. The egg white omelet is still on the menu, and it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Mm, and it's not that delicious. So uh, one of the roles, and by the way, guys, so the LDL, as you mentioned, when you say low-density lipoprotein, you don't say the word cholesterol. It's a carrier molecule. And specifically with LDL, this carries, uh, it can scoop up cholesterol and carry it to your neurons to help processes in your brain that need to happen that it can, they can't happen without cholesterol. It's that important. That's right. We need LDL. The, the issue is when LDL gets damaged, and the surefire way to damage your LDL, have high blood sugar. And here's what's even uh, more head-scratching, and that is that the statin medications that lower your cholesterol mm. are associated with about a 40% increased risk for type 2 diabetes, yeah. which is a far bigger risk for heart disease and Alzheimer's. So, uh, you know, that's, that's nuts. information that is published in our most well-respected peer-reviewed journals. People have to know that, that they're taking a drug that's ostensibly good for their heart. Meanwhile, they're dramatically increasing their risk for diabetes, which is horrible for the heart and profoundly detrimental for the brain. I've got to share this, and this is directly from your book. Speaking of which, uh, National Institutes of Health state, um, so researchers compare memory function in elderly individuals to cholesterol levels. They found that the people who did not suffer from dementia had much better memory function if they had higher levels of cholesterol. And the conclusion of the report states, high cholesterol is associated with better memory function. All right. Who knew? Crazy. You know, uh, you can get excited about this stuff because people are to this day thinking cholesterol is the enemy and drive it down as low as possible. You know, uh, it's hard to compete with the um, uh, direct-to-consumer pharmaceutical ads that are playing on the evening news. I understand that. Uh, but that's why, again, we do our best to write books and appear on your show and do everything we can just to get this message out. Yeah. Hey, if people read all this and now understand, uh, get some balance in their lives, understand both sides of the story, then make an inf your decision is then informed. Uh, but the idea of doing what the ads tell you to do, and therefore your doctors tell you to do, uh, is not a fully informed decision. Mm. You know, one of the most profound things, and it, it, you know, I know this already, but it's just the way that it was layered in your book, talking about how important fats are for the brain, but specifically omega-3. So let's talk about some other important brain nutrients for people. Maybe we can just even bullet point them, but I want to spend a little bit of time 
on omega threes? Like, why does this matter so much for brain health, specifically in reducing our risk for dementia and Alzheimer's? Well, omega threes are obviously a, a very important type of fat uh, to be contrasted with the more pro-inflammatory omega sixes that are found in your typical store-bought uh, corn oil, soy oil, safflower oil, etc. So even from the perspective of understanding another entree into lowering inflammation, we want to favor omega-3 over omega-6s. In the typical American diet, uh, when you look at blood work uh, based upon what people are eating and this, as reflected in their blood, you see that people are generally have a ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 of about 20 to 1. Far more pro-inflammatory omega-6, we need more omega-3s. The ratio should be 2 to 1 or even 1 to 1. One of the critical brain-related omega-3s is called DHA, docosahexaenoic acid. It is found in fish. It's uh, why fish is brain food, fish oils being so important. But you know what, Sean? It, it turns out that the richest source of DHA in nature is human breast milk. Who knew? Right. Uh, it's so important for the brain. It's so important for reducing inflammation. So DHA does some wonderful things. It's a natural, what we call COX-2 inhibitor. So it acts to reduce inflammation like certain drugs do. It's also a critical part of the cell membranes like cholesterol. But in addition, uh, DHA does something else really important. It, like aerobic exercise, stimulates the, the genes to make uh, BDNF and that causes the growth of new brain cells. When you look at blood levels of DHA, and compare them to dementia risk work from a Rush a Hospital by Dr. Martha Claire Morris, you see that there's a wonderful correlation that those individuals with the highest blood levels of DHA, as well as those individuals with the highest consumption of DHA, have dramatic reductions in risk for becoming demented. So DHA is absolutely on the list. Uh, this could be fish oil, uh, supplements, it can be derived from uh, vegetarian sources like algae, um, you can eat fish, eat sardines, wonderful uh, choice because of the DHA uh, component. This is just profound. And uh, this is directly from your book again. This is in the journal Neurology. And it was, it was a little bit of a long, longer term study and uh, following study participants, 280 folks. And for the people who never consumed fish, the risk of dementia and Alzheimer's disease during the four-year follow-up period was increased by 37%. In individuals who consume fish on a daily basis, risk of these diseases reduced by 44%. That's right. And you know, that study in particular is interesting because it is a very, very long-term study uh, that right. it's looking at data or, or, or the results of, of lifestyle choices from a long, long time ago up till the study was published. That said, uh, I would indicate that we should temper our enthusiasm towards fish in general these days because fish isn't, you know, it's not your grandfather's fish anymore. That right. fish yeah, these yeah. days uh, is certainly something to be concerned about in terms of A, toxicity, and B, the fact that so much uh, of the fish that's available is farm-raised. And that is really an issue because farm-raised fish are treated with antibiotics. They are fed uh, who knows what. Oftentimes it's uh, grain yeah. that has been uh, exposed to an herbicide called it glyphosate. It reduces their omega-3 ratio. It reduces their omega-3s. They dye the food so it uh, with carotenoids so that the fish flesh will turn orange uh, artificially. Uh, and the conditions in which these fish are raised are, you know, are highly uh, toxic. And that nothing, there's no alchemy here. You can't have a toxic environment and create golden, wonderful fish. So, you know, eat, eat a lot of fish, but it's got to be wild fish, wild saltwater type fish. I'm not so keen on freshwater fish, especially that which is, even though it's wild, that comes from, for example, the Great Lakes. But wild uh, sockeye uh, salmon um, from Alaska, king salmon, uh, coho salmon, really wonderful choices in terms of a, a really good source of protein with the added benefit of terrific brain healthy fat. Yes, and you also added the note in here of people who regularly consumed omega-3-rich oils such as olive, 
Flaxseed and walnut oils were 60% less likely to develop dementia than those who did not regularly consume those oils. So what we want to do is get a mixture, you know, have some variety in our diet. That That's right. And you know, when, when Grain Brain was written, the PREDIMED study had not been uh, published as yet. And let me just briefly tell you what that study was. Uh, it compared the risk of dementia in people on a standard American diet, uh, who only knows what that is like, compared to what has gotten a lot of popularity as of late called the Mediterranean diet. But the PREDIMED spin on this comparison was in addition to the Mediterranean diet, these uh, participants were uh, told to consume a full liter each week of olive oil. It's not that much, I drink that much uh, at least. Um, and they found that a, there was a dramatic reduction in risk for dementia and breast cancer, I might add, in those people who had not just the fat-rich Mediterranean diet, but even more added fat to their regimen. Think about it, we're talking about e eating more and more fat because it's good for your health. Wow, paradigm shift, paradigm shift. This is so fascinating. Um, there's two quick things I want to ask you about before we let you go. Um, tests. What tests do you recommend for people to uncover a gluten sensitivity? Um, because this is something, again, if you're not, if you don't test positive for celiac, then you're just kind of brushed off. It can't be sure. this. Well, understand that I recommend everybody go gluten free. Why? Because the research shows that 100% of humans have an increased permeability of their gut lining when exposed to gliadin, one of the proteins in gluten. So I don't wait for a blood test to tell a patient uh, or any individual, yeah. you need to be gluten-free because it's it's uh, what I'm saying to 100% of people based upon the research. Uh, there are studies available. One is called Cyrex, C-Y-R-E-X. It's very good at looking beyond celiac disease, at looking to a host of measurable uh, antibodies and other markers that may relate to being uh, gluten sensitive. Yeah. Uh, but you know, to me, it's uh, we like to do dietary restriction and see how people improve, and that really is very, very convincing. Oftentimes, more convincing than having a positive blood test. Now, last question for everybody: We've learned so much uh, here in this conversation, but. Uh, what are some of the things that we can do without wheat? All right, I know it sounds like a crazy question, but for for many of us, it's a staple. Not not a lot of the people listening, but for this is going to get to some people who don't know a lot about this information. But without wheat, what can Great. folks do? Um, well, there are plenty of of gluten free grains out there. Uh, we we mentioned, for example, quinoa, uh, but I think you know a, a, a general shift away from cereal grains is going to be a good thing uh, because of just the, the overall lowering of your carb intake. Having some wild rice uh, that is organic is, is a, not a bad idea, but you've got to watch portion control in terms of the carbohydrate load. Uh, there's been some concern as of late with respect to rice uh, having you know, uh, arsenic issues, and I, I've actually blogged about that. Um, so I think that, you know, the main thing we want to be sure of, and it's a, it really gets back to your question, and that is that people get adequate amounts of fiber if they decide to drop the wheat, for example, because, you know, the upside of eating wheat is it's giving people fiber, it's, uh, but it's a bit of, of a Faustian uh, agreement here that you're making a, a deal with the devil here, and uh, yeah, you're getting your fiber, but it comes along, you know, along with that fiber is the downside. And you can get fiber without the downside, with nothing but an upside. Yeah. So surprisingly, uh, fiber-rich foods are, are things like many vegetables. And if you're emphasizing what's called prebiotic fiber, which is the most important thing, uh, aspect of fiber, to nurture your gut bacteria, then you want to eat foods like jicama, dandelion greens, garlic, onions, leeks, uh, chicory root. Uh, lots of vegetables, really worthwhile adding to your program. And if you don't think you're getting enough of that on a daily basis, uh, you do what I do, and that is I add organic prebiotic fiber uh, to uh, you know our protein drink in the morning, or usually that's midday, uh, along with coconut oil, for example. But you can go to the health food store and buy fiber, prebiotic fiber, that comes from the acacia tree in, in Africa harvested sustainably, made from a resin that this tree secretes, and your gut bacteria are going to be very, very happy. And they're gonna say, we're gonna take care of this guy 
because he's giving us what we need. That's what symbiosis is all about. Perfect. Uh, this has just been such a fascinating conversation, and I'm truly, truly grateful for uh, you putting your time, effort, and energy into creating Grain Brain. And uh, I know you know you've already impacted the lives of so many people with this. And uh, I just want to say thank you because... Um, Sean, I, and I want to say yeah. thank you too. You know, you've got a, a very, very powerful, uh, wide-reaching platform and you use it to do good things. So um, that is a, that's a beautiful mission and I praise you for it. Oh, I received that Dr. Perlmutter and uh, truly appreciate uh, you taking the time to share your wisdom with everybody. Can you let everybody know where they can find your books and where they can, can connect with you online? Sure. My books are in uh, are in 30 countries now. So, uh, but if you go to any any uh, bookstore, Amazon, uh, Barnes and Noble online, you can find them there. Uh, I'd like your viewers to connect with me in as many ways as possible. Facebook is David Perlmutter, MD. I post every day. I do a lot of live videos. I did a live video, as I mentioned just yesterday, from Washington. Uh, my um, website is very very rich in terms of as, as serving as a resource for all of the stu studies that I quote in my books, that I quote in my blogs, and that is David, uh, correction, I'm sorry, it's drperlmutter.com. And if you go to drperlmutter.com uh, uh, backslash or forward slash, I think it is, subscribe, uh, that's where you can get onto our newsletter. Or just go to drperlmutter.com and sign up for our newsletter. We send that out every week, uh, link to some really cool stuff, and, um, you know, it's all about uh, being a doctor. Doctor means teacher. Yes. And uh, that's what the mission has become for me. So once again, I appreciate this opportunity. That's it, everybody. Dr. David Perlmutter. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom today. Everybody, thank you so much for tuning into the show. I appreciate you immensely. I hope you got a lot of value out of this. This is definitely, again, this should be in your library like yesterday if you don't already have Grain Brain. Uh, it's an incredible... Uh, treatise on this topic, but also just foundational information for human health. And I don't think that there are very many books that cover such a wide range of issues, but really drilling down on this core concept of this particular food substance that has been integrated into the human diet and looking at what is it really doing inside of our bodies and what are some of the things that we can do to actually reverse some of these issues and I think that that's a really strong message to pay attention to as well. Now, I, one of the last questions I asked him, like, what do we do? All right, what do we do without having this bread in our diet? And this is something, again, we've seen in recent human history is kind of like our give us our daily bread. It's this um, breaking bread, right? It's so ingrained in our culture, ingrained in our culture, that we need to try to find a way to how do we supplant that? And for me, it's really simple. Just add more fat add more vegetables and add more high quality kind of lower glycemic fruits. It really crowds out the need for that. And there's so many great options and substitutes when you do want to have kind of your flaky, doughy, bready type thing with low glycemic flours, you know, things like coconut flour and a little bit of tapioca and all these different things that you can combine and make some wonderful dishes. And he actually has a cookbook. Shout out to the cookbook as well. Another New York Times bestseller. So there's lots of uh, of options for us. And it's not putting us in a situation of lack. It's putting us in a situation of surplus and options. It's just getting out of that, what he talked about during this episode, living that average life, because that average is not very good today. We want to live above average. We want to become allergic, dare I say, allergic to average. All right. And that's what you deserve. You deserve to have the health, the happiness, the success that is worthy of your greatness. And I hope that you got a lot of value out of this again today. And uh, make sure to share this with your friends and family out on social media, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all that good stuff. And of course, tag me. I love to see that, that engagement. I appreciate you immensely. We've got some great show topics and guests coming up. So make sure to stay tuned. Take care. Have an amazing day. And I'll talk with you soon.